Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. The Mersey Beats are back on tour with 60s Gold. This autumn, they're going around the UK with a fabulous bill of 60s legends. And I'm delighted to say the star of the Mersey Beats, Tony Crane, joins us now live from Liverpool. How are you doing? Hello, Alex. Uh, uh, it's good to talk to you. It's lovely to talk to you. I mean, I've got such great affinity and love for Liverpool. A, because the best bands come from there, and also B, the best comedians come from there. Well, yeah, it, they, they always say about Liverpool, um, every taxi driver is a better comedian than the famous comedians. Yes. And <laughs> if you're not a comedian, you don't come from Liverpool. Yeah. This is the thing. And I think it was Doddy who said you've got to be a comedian to live in Liverpool. Well, you have to be, really. It's, uh, it's completely mad. But uh, they're very proud people from Liverpool. Mm. You know, they, they remember all the, the people who've made it big, even back as far as, like, Ted Ray and people like that. Mm. Um, so they're very proud people about the, the history of Liverpool. And, of course, what's wonderful, too, is because it was such a melting pot for decades, it's got such culture and such class and such creative. I mean, it's one of the most diverse places in the world, and I think that's a reason, culturally, why it's brought so many stars to the world. I'm sure it was. I was even talking this to my family yesterday where I went to visit my relations and uh, we were talking about where I was born and brought up in the south end of Liverpool, near, near the docks. And there was such a, uh, the League of Nations, they called it, and there was different people from all over the world coming in on the ships and uh, staying there and somebody stayed for a while and somebody carried on. Of course, that's where... Um, the birth of what we call Mersey Beat, the birth of the sound began because of that. There was all the ships coming in from mainly America and uh, the sailors were bringing in these records that no one had ever heard of, uh, of these obscure labels, small labels in America. And uh, they were bringing them in, playing them to people, playing these songs, and uh, one by one the bands got to know these songs and um, we all tried to find them before anybody else did and mm. um, we always had a thing on the cavern that um, whoever got whoever played the song first that they found off one of these labels the rest of the bands wouldn't do it it was classed as your song then wow. it's like we, we did it where, when we did lunchtime sessions at the cavern was all run round to Nems uh, Brian Epstein's place and listen to all the new little releases that had come in because he started importing all these small labels from America, you see. Mm. So we'd go in and have a listen. If there was a song we liked, we'd quickly rush back to the cabin, rehearse it, and then play it that night at the cabin mm. before anybody else did it. <laughs> so it was great. So it was, you know, um, it, it was wonderful the way the music took over, really. It was, uh, it was fantastic. And we look at those people that you got to work with, um, just that community of people, obviously Jerry and the Pacemakers uh, being one of the biggest and, of course, the Beatles. I mean, what an extraordinary time. You must look back now and think it was some kind of movie because you wouldn't believe it if you wrote it in a, an autobiography. People would say, no, it couldn't have been that glamorous. But it, it was, but it wasn't. It was just your mates. Well, it was weird at the time because... Um we were so young, we were the youngest band to play at the cavern. And um, of course the Beatles called us those kids, you know. So when we started playing uh, uh, we were called, well, we were originally called the Mavericks. And then we, we, when we became residents at the cavern, um, Bob Waller, who was the booking agent for the cavern, he said, uh, I want you to be resident there, but I don't like your name, I'll think of a new name for you. I went, okay. so. We went mad because he, he said, I'm going to launch you uh, on a place called the Entry Institute, which was a big venue in Liverpool mm. at the time. And um, I ran down. We still waited for the Liverpool Echo to come out to see the advert. And I run down to the cabin. I said, you said we're going to be on this weekend and we're not on. I said, there's some new band called the Mercy Beats on their top of the bill. Who are they? He said, well, that's your new name. <laughs> so our initial reaction to that was, oh, no, you could have called us the Liverpool Echoes or the Liverpool Post, Daily Post or something. Because, <laughs> of course, at the time, 
Mercy Beat was only the name of a paper. It was um, a local paper around Merseyside, and it just listed all the venues all around Merseyside that all the bands were playing on, well, groups that were called then, of course. And um, so we thought, fancy being called after a paper. just seems to be strange. But then I think the first time we played at the Cavern and the Beatles were on as well, I remember John Lennon said to me, I don't half like your new name. He said, it's absolutely fabulous. Who thought of that? Wow. He said, did you get permission of Bill Harry? He was the editor of Mercy Beat, you see. I said, apparently so, yeah. And he said, oh, no. I thought, well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's a good name. I thought, that'll do, you know. Wow, fantastic. And then, of course, we must talk about Scylla. Was that story as true as it's become, or was it just a very small part of Cavern history that's just become iconic and legendary? Well, the story about Scylla was, um, I mean, there was other people on the door, but when she became on the door, taking the coats, they called it, it wasn't, I think America, they call her a hatchet girl, but it's, um, she was just there, you'd take take a coat off you, could give you a little ticket so you could pick it up on your way out, you know, mm-hmm. your top coat, and that was it. But she used to hang around then, and she'd come round when, when all everyone was, everywhere was full. She'd come to the stage, the, the dressing room, and say to you, whichever band is on, can I get up and give a song? Can I get up and give a song? Because um, King Size Tail and the Dominoes has let me go up and sing with them. And the seniors, Daddy and the seniors, have let me sing with them. But um, I, to be honest, I kept making an excuse. I said, well, I don't even know what you sing like. <laughs> but uh, when they asked us, I said, we're not allowed to let anyone go up and sing with us. But, um, and that's all she was. She just hung around all the bands asking, can she get up? And she always sang the same songs. Did she? She always sang Summertime or Fever. Right. That was about it, really. And, um, and that was it. That's all she ever did. Uh, but she came friendly, of course, with the Beatles and that. And when, um, when Brian Epstein was looking for a girl singer to promote, uh, the obvious one was a girl called Beryl Marsden who was quite big at the cavern. She was on like two or three times a week and uh, she, she'd she had a record out. And um, so we all thought, oh, he's gonna go with Beryl Marsden. But apparently John Lennon had said, oh, you'll have to have a listen to this girl called Priscilla White. Um, he said, you'll have to listen to her sing, he said, because I think she could be really big, you know. Oh, and that was it, he gave her a test and next minute she got a recording contract. How fantastic. She changed her name to Cella Black, you know, and I thought, mm-hmm. that was, came from nowhere, just a few little appearances on the cavern. You know? Wow. Um, then we look at your musical legacy and the fact that in 2019 we still care. It is extraordinary how timeless this music is. I worked on Gold Radio in London for a year or two and it was one of the most brilliant years of my life. And that radio station is still going strong. To think you could sustain a service just playing your type of music is incredible. Why is it so timeless? Is it sort of the skiffle be under it that keeps it relevant? What is it musically that keeps it? Well, my personal view is it, it's like an old-fashioned way of saying it. They were all good tunes, memorable tunes. So if, if somebody comes along and out the blue they start singing a song which was a hit in the 60s everyone still knows it everyone still sings along to it it's there's such memorable tunes memorable songs it's like for instance our songs we owe a lot to Bert Bacharach and Al David because you know they came up with some fantastic songs fantastic memorable songs Hal David did the lyrics of course and Bert Bacharach did the tunes so um it was just wonderful the way, um, and of course, when John and Paul started writing, all John and Paul were trying to do is write like the 50s artists. Mm. You know, they were trying to write like uh, Little Richard and um, Elvis and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and people like that, you know. And uh, that's all they were trying to do right from the start. They were trying to image, because all of, because obviously when the Beatles first started, all they were singing was covers of Elvis and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis and different, mainly mainly early Elvis stuff, you know, and some records and that. And um, so when they 
started writing their own material. They, they had a few songs that they'd written uh, that they used to play on the Kevin, you know, and but it was sort of all right. Um, Hello, little girl, and things like that. Uh, but occasionally they'd sort of say, "Here's one we've written ourselves," you know. Mm. And uh, but other than that, they didn't really start writing properly till Brian Epstein told them. He had a good talk to them, and he said, "If you're going to make it really big, be really good. You've got to write some more of your own material." So he got oh. them to write more and more. So. And was I think of you the biggest hit that sort of made you realise you'd made it? Well, yeah, it was a, it was a funny thing that we, we'd had a record out in the summer of um, '63. That was it's love that really counts. That was a bit Bacharach song and Pal David. And um, that was a sort of a minor hit for us. I think it got to number 20 or something, or 18 or something in the charts. And then we were looking for a follow-up. But um, when we recorded the first one, uh, It's Love That Really Counts, we thought that the B-side was going to be the A-side because we went we went down to London and got um, did a recording session and we recorded four songs. And we thought... Um, so they picked out which ones, and they picked out um, Fortune Teller, which was such a popular song that we did on the cavern, and it's all that really counts. Well, we were more or less known as a rock and roll, rhythm and blues band, really, but occasionally we did ballads. Occasionally we did Slow Every With A Song or something like that. But um, when we went, we were told to go back to the cavern and have a vote got Bob Waller to do it, have a vote, tell all the fans, these two songs are going to be our first single, which one should be the A-side? And we all thought, ah, oh, it's going to be Fortune Teller, no problem with that, you know. But then they all voted for the club that really counts. Uh, so hence, we got labelled then as a ballad band right. um, because of that. So when we were looking for the follow-up to the club that really counts, um, a demo came in by a guy called Peter Lee Sterling who later started recording with Daniel Boone and he was just an up-and-coming young songwriter and he came in with this song and it didn't have any instrumental with it at all he just sort of sang it with a guitar and we thought mm, it's one of those songs said, what do you think? and Jack Baberstock, our producer said at the time this is one of those songs that will either not sell a copy or it will be a worldwide massive hit because it was so different, you see, Latin mm. American, yeah. everything else. It wasn't like what was in the charts at all. So we recorded it and then we added the little tune to it at the beginning, in the middle, at the end. And I think that made it really, made it stand out a bit more. And uh, so we came out the studio at about five in the morning and we, we all said to each other, it's exactly right what he said. <laughs> We've either wasted our time or it'll be a massive hit. When it came out, it came out and it was sort of the lower end of the charts. But then we got a great plug by our friends, the Beatles, of course. When they played it, all the Beatles jumped up and went, yeah, hit, they're our friends, they're our mates. Mm. Uh, here we go, this is fabulous, you know. So the next week it went straight into the top ten. As endorsements so go, it's not bad, is it? To do that, and then that was it then. Wow, incredible. And then let's just yeah. finally talk about recreating the songs today in 2019. The 60s Gold Tour uh, starts in September and goes through for nearly three months. Just incredible success. People want to hear uh, these songs with these legends too. What a lineup you've got. Herman's Hermits, of course, we've got Mersey Beats with yourself. We've got Wayne Fontana, uh, we've got Marmalade and Steve Ellis too. Uh, incredible uh, lineup of stars, and there you'll be recreating these songs. It must be exciting, A, to be asked, and B, to know you're going to go down a storm. Well, it's great to be as we're doing these tours. I absolutely love doing these tours because obviously we meet up with all our old friends we've known for that many years. And, it, you know, it's great that everybody's still going and still doing it. And it's good to know that when you do go on stage, you know that. The, the people who come to these shows, they know every word of every song that you sing. So whatever you sing, your hits, everyone's singing along in the audience, having a great time. Mm. And it, it's wonderful to see that. Um, yeah, don't get the words wrong. We're going to know, aren't we? That's the problem. No, no, no. <laughs> well, you don't do that. No, they'd sing.
sing it for you, you know. Because every now and again you stop singing, let the crowd carry on singing mm. for you, you know, which is really good. And it's um, and I keep getting congratulated uh, by everyone for. Um, I was awarded an MBE in uh, about 18 months ago now from the Queen, uh, Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, so everyone sings along and they, they often show congratulations, Tony. <laughs> What a thrill and what a life. What an incredible career. You can see Tony Crane and the Mersey Beats at the 60s Gold UK Tour starting on the 27th of September at the Concord Club in Eastleigh going via Torquay in Dartford and Wickham in October starting in Leicester in November and ending in Leeds in December. It's a huge, great, big, long tour. Have a fantastic time and thank you so much for talking to me. Nice 